Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the March 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and we're continuing our reading of Black Shirts and Reds, Rational Fascism and the Overthrow of Communism by Michael Parenti, reading chapters 2, Let Us Now Praise Revolution, and 3, Left Anti-Communism. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So as I stated in the first video, part one of this reading, which included the front matter table of contents up through chapter one, I normally like to cover works in just one video. I think that it's a lot easier to handle that way. However, sometimes with some of the longer works, they really need to be broken down into pieces, just as far as for practical reasons, getting them uploaded in a timely way and getting the work completed and all that. But when the work has finally been recorded, I will stitch together all the different videos and make one complete file out of it. All right, so that said, let's get into the text. Chapter 2, Let Us Now Praise Revolution. For most of this century, U.S. foreign policy has been devoted to the suppression of revolutionary governments and radical movements around the world. The turn of the 20th century found the McKinley administration in a war of attrition against the people of the Philippines, lasting from 1898 to 1902, with pockets of resistance continuing for years afterward. In that conflict, U.S. forces slaughtered some 200,000 Filipino women, men, and children. Footnote there, citing Leon Wolf, Little Brown Brother, New York, 1960. At about that time, in conjunction with various European colonial powers, the United States invaded China to help suppress the Boxer Rebellion at a substantial loss of life to the Chinese rebels. U.S. forces took over Hawaii, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Guam, and in the following decades invaded Mexico, Soviet Russia, Nicaragua, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, and other countries, actions that usually inflicted serious losses upon the populations of these countries. The Costs of Counter-Revolution From grade school and through grad school, few of us are taught anything about these events, except to be told that U.S. forces must intervene in this or that country in order to protect U.S. interests, thwart aggression, and defend our national security. U.S. leaders fashioned other convenient rationales for their interventions abroad. The public was told that the peoples of various countries were in need of our civilizing guidance and desired the blessings of democracy, peace, and prosperity. To accomplish this, of course, it might be necessary to kill off considerable numbers of the more recalcitrant among them. Such were the measures our policymakers were willing to pursue in order to, quote, uplift lesser peoples. The emergence of major communist powers like the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China lent another dimension to U.S. global counter-revolutionary policy. The communists were depicted as evil incarnate, demonized conspirators who sought power for power's sake. The United States had to be everywhere to counteract this spreading, quote, cancer, we were told. In the name of democracy, U.S. leaders waged a merciless war against revolutionaries in Indochina for the better part of 20 years. They dropped many times more tons of explosives on Vietnam than were used throughout World War II by all combatants combined. Testifying before a congressional committee, former CIA director William Colby admitted that under his direction, U.S. forces and their South Vietnam collaborators carried out the selective assassination of 24,000 Vietnamese dissidents in what was known as the Phoenix Program. His associate, the South Vietnamese Minister of Information, maintained that 40,000 was a more accurate estimate. Footnote, Mark Lane, Plausible Denial, Thunder's Mouth Press, 1991. U.S. policymakers and their media mouthpieces judged the war a, quote, mistake, because the Vietnamese proved incapable of being properly instructed by B-52 bomber raids and death squads. By prevailing against this onslaught, the Vietnamese supposedly demonstrated that they were, quote, unprepared for our democratic institutions, unquote. In pursuit of counter-revolution and in the name of freedom, U.S. forces or U.S.-supported surrogate forces slaughtered two million North Koreans in a three-year war, three million Vietnamese, over 500,000 in aerial wars over Laos and Cambodia, over 1.5 million in Angola, over 1 million in Mozambique, 
over 500,000 in Afghanistan, 500,000 to 1 million in Indonesia, 200,000 in East Timor, 100,000 in Nicaragua, combining the Somoza and Reagan eras, over 100,000 in Guatemala, plus an additional 40,000 disappeared, over 700,000 in Iraq, over 60,000 in El Salvador, 30,000 in the, quote, dirty war of Argentina, though the government admits to only 9,000, 35,000 in Taiwan, when the Kuomintang military arrived from China, 20,000 in Chile, and many thousands in Haiti, Panama, Grenada, Brazil, South Africa, Western Sahara, Zaire, Turkey, and dozens of other countries, in what amounts to a free market world holocaust. There was a footnote there off of the Iraq number. It says, the 1991 war waged by the Bush administration against Iraq, this is Bush Sr., which claimed an estimated 200,000 victims, was followed by U.S.-led United Nations economic sanctions. A study by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, The Children Are Dying, 1996, reports that since the end of the war, again, this book was written in 97, 567,000 Iraqi children have died of starvation and disease, and tens of thousands more suffered defects and illnesses due to the five years of sanctions. Back to the text. Official sources either deny these U.S.-sponsored mass murders or justify them as necessary measures that had to be taken against an implacable communist foe. Anti-communist propaganda saturated our airwaves, schools, and political discourse. Despite repeated and often factitious references to the tyranny of the Red Menace, the anti-communist opinion makers never spelled out what communists actually did in the way of socioeconomic policy. This might explain why, despite decades of red-bashing propaganda, most Americans, including many who number themselves among the political cognoscenti, still cannot offer an informed statement about the social policies of communist countries. The anti-red propagandists uttered nary a word about how revolutionaries in Russia, China, Cuba, Vietnam, Nicaragua, and other countries nationalized the lands held by rich exploitative landlords and initiated mass programs for education, health, housing, and jobs. Not a word about how their efforts advanced the living standards and life chances of hundreds of millions in countries that had long suffered under the yoke of feudal oppression and Western colonial pillage, an improvement in mass well-being never before witnessed in history. No matter that the revolutionaries in various Asian, African, and Latin American countries enjoyed popular support and were willing to pursue a neutralist course in East-West relations, rather than place themselves under the hegemony of either Moscow or Peking. They still were targeted for a counter-revolutionary battering. From opposing communists because they might be revolutionaries, it was a short step to opposing revolutionaries because they might be communists. The real sin of revolutionaries, communist or not, was that they championed the laboring classes against the wealthy few. They advocated changes in the distribution of class power and the way wealth was produced and used. They wanted less individualistic advancement at the expense of the many and collective betterment for the entire working populace. Presumptions of Power Ruling classes throughout the world hate and fear communism, not for its lack of political democracy, but because it attempts to establish economic democracy by building an egalitarian, collectivist social system, though they rarely come right out and say as much. This counter-revolutionary interventionist policy rests on several dubious assumptions that might be stated and rebutted as follows. 1. U.S. leaders have the right to define the limits of socioeconomic development within other nations. Not true. Under no canon of international law or any other legal stricture do the leaders of this country have the right to ordain what kind of economic system or mode of social development another country may adopt no more right than do the leaders of other countries have to dictate such things to the United States. In practice, the option to dictate is exercised by the strong over the weak, a policy of might, not right. 2. The United States must play a counter-revolutionary containment role in order to protect our national interests. This is true only if we equate, quote, our national interests with the investment interests of high finance. U.S. interventionism has been very effective in building neo-imperialism, keeping the land, labor, 
natural resources and markets of third world countries available at bargain rates to multinational corporations. But these corporate interests do not represent the interests of the U.S. people. The public pays for the huge military budgets and endures the export of its jobs to foreign labor markets, the inflow of thousands of impoverished immigrants who compete for scarce employment and housing, and various other costs of empire. There's a footnote there. For a further discussion of this and related points, see my book, Against Empire, City Lights Books, 1995, Chapter 4. Furthermore, revolutionary governments like Cuba, Libya, Vietnam, and North Korea were, and still are, eager to trade and maintain peaceful relations with this country. These countries do not threaten the national security of the United States or its people, but the overseas interests of global capitalism. If allowed to multiply in numbers, countries with an alternative socialist system, one that uses the land, labor, capital, and natural resources in collectivist ways, placing people before profits, would eventually undermine global capitalism. 3. The United States has a moral obligation to guarantee the stability of nations that are undergoing democratic development but are threatened by revolutionaries and terrorists. In fact, most U.S. interventions are on behalf of corrupt and self-serving oligarchs and anti-democratic militarists who take power with or without the benefit of U.S.-sponsored showcase elections. Third world oligarchs are frequently educated at elite U.S. universities or end up on the CIA payroll as do their police chiefs and military officers, many of whom receive training in torture and assassination at U.S. counterinsurgency institutions. There's a footnote there. On the U.S. training of torturers and assassins, see the Washington Post, September 21, 1996. I'll add, if you want to look up something, look up the School of the Americas. Back to the text. 4. Fundamental social change should be peacefully pursued within the established order of nations rather than by revolutionary turmoil. U.S. policymakers maintain that they favor eliminating mass poverty in poorer countries, and that they're not opposed to the laudatory objectives of social revolution, but just to its violent methods. They say that transformations must be effected gradually and peacefully, preferably through private investment and the benign workings of the free market. In fact, Corporate investment is more likely to deter rather than encourage reform by preempting markets and restructuring the local economy to fit foreign capital extraction needs. International finance capital has no interest in bettering the life chances of third world peoples. Generally, as Western investments have increased in the third world, life conditions for the ordinary peasants and workers have grown steadily more desperate. Who's violence? People throughout the world do not need more corporate investments. Rather, they need the opportunity to wrest back their land, labor, natural resources, and markets in order to serve their own social needs. Such a revolutionary development invites fierce opposition from apostles of the free market, whose violent resistance to social change makes peaceful transformation impossible to contemplate. Even in countries like the United States, where reforms of limited scope have been achieved without revolution, the, quote, peaceful means employed have entailed popular struggle and turmoil and a considerable amount of violence and bloodshed, almost all of it inflicted by police and security forces. That last point frequently goes unmentioned in discussions about the ethics of revolutionary violence. The very concept of revolutionary violence is somewhat falsely cast, since most of the violence comes from those who attempt to prevent reform, not from those struggling for it. By focusing on the violent rebellions of the downtrodden, we overlook the much greater repressive force and violence utilized by the ruling oligarchs to maintain the status quo, including armed attacks against peaceful demonstrations, mass arrests, torture, destruction of opposition organizations, suppression of dissident publications, death squad assassinations, the extermination of whole villages, and the like. Most social revolutions begin peaceably. Why would it be otherwise? Who would not prefer to assemble and demonstrate rather than engage in mortal combat against pitiless forces that enjoy every advantage in mobility and firepower? Revolutions in Russia, China, Vietnam, and El Salvador all began peacefully, with crowds of peasants and workers launching nonviolent protests, only to be met with violent oppression from the authorities. Peaceful protest and reform are exactly what the people are denied 
by the ruling oligarchs. The dissidents who continue to fight back, who try to defend themselves from the oligarchs' repressive fury, are then called violent revolutionaries and terrorists. For those local and international elites who maintain control over most of the world's wealth, social revolution is an abomination. Whether it be peaceful or violent is a question of no great moment to them. Peaceful reforms that infringe upon their profitable accumulations and threaten their class privileges are as unacceptable to them as the social upheaval imposed by revolution. Reforms that advance the conditions of life for the general public are not as materially intractable or as dependent on capital resources as we have been led to believe. There's no great mystery to building a health clinic or carrying out programs for food rationing, land redistribution, literacy, jobs, and housing. Such tasks are well within the capacity of any state if there is the political will and a mobilization of popular class power. Consider Kerala, a state in India where the actions of popular organizations and mass movements have won important victories over the last 40 years against politico-economic oppression, generating a level of social development considerably better than that found in most of the third world, and accomplished without outside investment. Kerala has mass literacy, a lower birth rate, and lower death rate than the rest of India, better public health services, fewer child workers, higher nutritional levels, thanks to a publicly subsidized food rationing system, more enlightened legal support and educational programs for women, and some social security protections for working people and for the destitute and physically handicapped. In addition, the people of Kerala radically altered a complex and exploitative system of agrarian relations and won important victories against the more horrid forms of caste oppression. Though Kerala has no special sources of wealth, it has had decades of communist organizing and political struggle that reached and moved large numbers of people and breathed life into the state's democracy. Quote, Despite its relatively short periods in the leadership of government, it is the Communist Party that has set the basic legislative agenda of the people of Kerala, notes Indian scholar V.K. Ramachandran, Monthly Review, May 1995. All this is not to deny that many people in Kerala endure unacceptable conditions of poverty. Still, despite a low level of income and limited resources, the achievements wrought by democratic government intervention and propelled by mass action have been substantial, representing the difference between a modestly supportable existence and utter misery. Many third world peoples produced dedicated and capable popular organizations, as did the communists in Kerala, but they're usually destroyed by repressive state forces. In Kerala, popular agitation and input took advantage of democratic openings and in turn gave more social substance to the democracy. What is needed for social betterment is not international monetary fund loans or corporate investments, but political organization and democratic opportunity and freedom from U.S.-sponsored state terrorism. U.S. foreign aid programs offer another example of how imperialist foreign policy masquerades as social reform within third world nations. Aid programs are not intended to affect serious social betterment. At best, they finance piecemeal projects of limited impact. More often, they're used to undermine local markets, drive small farmers off their land, build transportation and office facilities needed by outside investors, increase a country's debt and economic dependency, and further open its economy to multinational corporate penetration. Free Market for the Few Third World Revolutionaries are branded as the enemies of stability. Stability is the code word for a society in which privileged social relations are securely entrenched. When popular forces mobilize against privilege and wealth, this causes instability which is judged to be undesirable by U.S. policymakers and their faithful flax in the U.S. corporate media. Here we have a deceptive state of affairs. What poses as a U.S. commitment to peaceful, nonviolent change is really a commitment to the violent defense of an unjust, undemocratic, global capitalism. The U.S. national security state uses coercion and violence not in support of social reform, but against it, all in the name of stability, counterterrorism democracy, and of late, and more honestly, the free market. When he was head of the State Department policy planning staff during the early years of the Cold War, the noted author, George Kennan, revealed the ruthless realpolitik mentality of those dedicated to social inequality within 
and between nations. Kennan maintained that a wealthy United States facing an impoverished world could not afford, quote, the luxury of altruism and world benefaction, and should cease talking about, quote, vague and unreal objectives such as human rights, the raising of the living standards, and democratization. The less we are hampered by idealistic slogans, the better, unquote. Sources PPS 23, U.S. State Department, February 1948. Speaking at a briefing for U.S. ambassadors to Latin America, Kennan remarked, quote, The final answer might be an unpleasant one, but we should not hesitate before police repression by the local government. This is not shameful since the communists are essentially traitors. It is better to have a strong, i.e. repressive, regime in power than a liberal government if it is indulgent and relaxed and penetrated by communists, unquote. In a 1949 State Department intelligence report, Kennan wrote that communists were, quote, people who are committed to the belief that the government has direct responsibility for the welfare of the people, unquote. So they had to be dealt with harshly, without regard for such niceties as democratization and human rights. It is said that the United States cannot renege on its commitments to other peoples, and must continue as world leader. The rest of the world expects that of us. But the ordinary peoples of the world have never called for U.S. world leadership. Quite the contrary, they usually want the United States to go home, and leave them to their own affairs. This is because U.S. commitments are not to the ordinary people of other lands, but to the privileged, reactionary factions that are most accommodating to Western investors. As Kennan's remarks indicate, the U.S. policymaking establishment has been concerned not with advancing the welfare of impoverished peoples around the world, but with defeating whoever allies themselves with the common people, be they Reds or not. Whatever their grave shortcomings, do not U.S.-supported Third World rulers represent something better than the kind of tyranny that communists and revolutionary totalitarians bring? Academic cheerleaders for U.S. interventionism, such as Samuel P. Huntington of Harvard University, think so. Quote, However bad a given evil may be, a worse one is always possible and often likely, Huntington concludes, going on to defend as, quote, lesser evils, the murderous regimes in Chile under Pinochet, and South Africa under apartheid. There's a footnote there citing the American Political Science Review, number 82, March 1988. In that same statement, Huntington describes Mangasutho Buthalesi, the CIA-supported head of the South African Inkatha Freedom Party, as a, quote, notable contemporary democratic reformer, unquote. It is a matter of public record that Buthalesi collaborated with the top-level apartheid military and police in the murder of thousands of African National Congress, ANC, supporters. Colonel Eugene de Kock, the highest-ranking officer convicted of apartheid crimes, who once described himself as the government's most efficient assassin, testified that he had supplied weapons, vehicles, and training to Buthalesi's organization for a total onslaught strategy against democratic, anti-apartheid forces, according to AP Report, San Francisco Chronicle, September 18, 96. There is no denying that Buthalesi is Huntington's kind of guy. Back to the main text. We might recall Gene Kirkpatrick's distinction between, quote, benign authoritarian right-wing governments that supposedly are not all that brutal and allow gradual change, and horrid totalitarian left-wing ones that suppress everyone. The real distinction is that the right-wing government maintains the existing privileged order of the free market, keeping the world safe for the empowered hierarchies and wealthy classes of the world. In contrast, the left-wing, quote, totalitarians want to abolish exploitative property relations and create a more egalitarian economic system. Their favoring the have-nots over the haves is what makes them so despicable in the eyes of the latter. U.S. leaders claim to be offended by certain features of social revolutionary governments, such as one-party rule and the coercive implementation of revolutionary change. But one-party autocracy is acceptable if the government is rightist, that is, friendly towards private corporate investment, as in Turkey, Zaire, Guatemala, Indonesia, and dozens of other countries, including even communist countries that are sliding down the free market path, such as China. We might recall that unforgettable moment when President George Bush, whose invasions of Panama and Iraq brought death and destruction to those nations, and who presided over a U.S. military empire that is the single greatest purveyor of violence in the world, lectured revolutionary leader Nelson Mandela on the virtues of nonviolence, even going so far as to quote Martin Luther King Jr. during Mandela's visit 
to Washington, D.C. in June 1990. Mandela's real sin in Bush's eyes was that he was part of a revolutionary movement that engaged in armed struggle against a violently repressive apartheid regime in South Africa. Bush's capacity for selective perception had all the unexamined audacity of a dominant ideology that condemns only those who act against an unjust status quo, not those who use violence to preserve it. It would have come as a great relief to people around the world if the President of the United States had adopted a policy of nonviolence for his own government. In fact, he had done no such thing. The Freedom of Revolution U.S. politico-economic leaders may find revolutionary reforms undesirable, but most people who live in revolutionary societies find them preferable to the old regimes and worth defending. The Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba was a fiasco, not because of, quote, insufficient air coverage, but because the Cuban people closed ranks behind their government and threw back the invaders. Another, quote, captive people, the North Vietnamese, acted in similar fashion in the early 1970s. Instead of treating the severe destruction and disruptions caused by the U.S. aerial war against their country as a golden opportunity to overthrow, quote, Hanoi's yoke, they continued to support their beleaguered government at great sacrifice to themselves. And in South Vietnam, the National Liberation Front enjoyed tactical opportunities for supply and surprise, largely because it was supported by people in the countryside and cities. During the Vietnam era, explanations as to why people sided with the communist revolutionaries came from some unexpected sources. U.S. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge admitted, quote, The only people who have been doing anything for the little man to lift him up have been the communists, quoting from the New York Times, February 27, 66. In a similar vein, one faithful propagator of the official line, columnist James Reston, wrote with surprising candor, quote, Even Premier Khoi, U.S.-sponsored dictator of South Vietnam, told this reporter today that the communists were closer to the people's yearnings for social justice and an independent life than his own government, quoting New York Times, September 1, 1965. What Lodge and Reston left unsaid was that the little man and the people's yearnings for social justice were the very things that U.S. leaders were bent on suppressing. Some people conclude that anyone who utters a good word about leftist one-party revolutions must harbor anti-democratic or, quote, Stalinist sentiments. But to applaud social revolutions is not to oppose political freedom. To the extent that revolutionary governments construct substantive alternatives for their people, they increase human options and freedom. There is no such thing as freedom in the abstract. I just want to comment there. I'm sorry to interrupt the flow. I'm always saying this about libertarians, where just the answer is always more freedom, and it's a code word for capitalism. Freedom is a relative term, okay? It's freedom from something. It's specific to a situation. So I really like that line uh, a lot. Continuing, there is no such thing as freedom in the abstract. There is freedom to speak openly and iconoclastically, freedom to organize a political opposition, freedom of opportunity to get an education and pursue a livelihood, freedom to worship as one chooses or not worship at all, freedom to live in healthful conditions, freedom to enjoy various social benefits, and so on. Most of what is called freedom gets its definition within a social context. Revolutionary governments extend a number of popular freedoms without destroying those freedoms that never existed in the previous regimes. They foster conditions necessary for national self-determination, economic betterment, the preservation of health and human life, and the end of many of the worst forms of ethnic, patriarchal, and class oppression. Regarding patriarchal oppression, consider the vastly improved condition of women in revolutionary Afghanistan and South Yemen before the counter-revolutionary repression in the 1990s, or in Cuba after the 1959 revolution, as compared to before. U.S. policymakers argue that social revolutionary victory anywhere represents a diminution of freedom in the world. The assertion is false. The Chinese Revolution did not crush democracy. There was none to crush in that oppressively feudal regime. The Cuban Revolution did not destroy freedom. It destroyed a hateful U.S.-sponsored police state. The Algerian Revolution did not abolish national liberties. Precious few existed under French colonialism. The Vietnamese revolutionaries did not abrogate individual rights. No such rights were available under the U.S.-supported puppet governments of Bao Dai, Diem, and Khoi. Of course, revolutions do limit the freedoms of the corporate property class and other privileged interests. 
the freedom to invest privately without regard to human and environmental costs, the freedom to live in obscene opulence while paying workers starvation wages, the freedom to treat the state as a private agency in the service of a privileged coterie, the freedom to employ child labor and child prostitutes, the freedom to treat women as chattel, and so on. Today, no one in U.S. policy circles worries about the politico-economic oppression suffered in dozens of right-wing client states. Their professed desire to bring Western political democracy to nations that have had revolutions rarely extends to free market autocracies, and the grudging moves toward political democracy occasionally made in these autocracies come only through popular pressure and rebellion and only with the unspoken understanding that democratic governance will not infringe substantially upon the interests of the moneyed class. What measure of pain? Is the pain of revolution worth the gain? Cost-benefit accounting is a complicated business when applied to social transactions. But have we ever bothered to compare the violence of revolution against the violence that preceded it? Quote, I do not know how one measures the price of historical victories, said Robert Halbrunner. I only know that the way in which we ordinarily keep the books of history is wrong." Unquote. We make no tally of the generations claimed by that combination of economic exploitation and political suppression so characteristic of the Ancien regimes, the hapless victims of flood and famine in the Yangtze Valley of yesterday, the child prostitutes found dead in the back alleys of old Shanghai, the musiques stricken by cold and starvation across the frozen steppes of Russia. And what of today? No one is tallying the thousands of nameless victims who succumbed to U.S.-trained torturers in Latin America, the hundreds of villages burned by counterinsurgency forces, the millions who are driven from their ancestral lands and sentenced to permanently stunted and malnourished lives, the millions more who perish in the desperate misery and congestion of shanty slums and internment camps. Their sufferings go unrecorded and are not figured in the balance when the revolution meets out justice to erstwhile oligarchs and oppressors or commits excesses and abuses of its own. And how do we measure the pain of the tens of millions of children throughout the world, many as young as six and seven, who are forced to work 70 hours a week, confined in ill-lit, poorly ventilated workshops, under conditions reminiscent of the most horrific days of the Industrial Revolution? The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, a sweeping multinational free trade act that amounts to a carte blanche for global capitalism, offers no protection for children who are exploited, abused, overworked, and underpaid. During GATT negotiations, leaders of third world countries successfully argued against placing any restrictions on child labor, arguing that children have always worked in their cultures and such traditional practices should be respected. To prohibit child labor would limit the free market and affect severe hardship on those poor families in which a child is often the only wage earner. Even if the long-standing practice of children helping out on farms is acceptable, assuming that they are not overworked and are allowed to go to school, the practice of, quote, locking them into a hot box of a factory for 14 hours a day is something else. Furthermore, they may be the only wage earner, quote, because adult workers have been laid off in favor of children who are infinitely more exploitable and provide bigger profits for prosperous factory owners, quoting Anna Quindlin in the New York Times, November 23rd, 94. Traveling across Cuba in 1959, immediately after the overthrow of the U.S.-supported right-wing Batista dictatorship, Mike Faulkner witnessed, quote, a spectacle of almost unrelieved poverty. The rural population lived in makeshift shacks without minimal sanitation. Malnourished children went barefoot in the dirt and suffered, quote, the familiar plague of parasites common to the third world. There were almost no doctors or schools, and through much of the year, families that depended solely on the seasonal sugar harvest lived close to starvation, quoting Monthly Review, March 96. How does that victimization in pre-revolutionary Cuba measure against the much more widely publicized repression that came after the revolution, when Castro's communists executed a few hundred of the previous regime's police assassins and torturers, drove assorted upper-class money bags into exile, and intimidated various other opponents of radical reforms into silence. Today, Cuba is a different place. For all its mistakes and abuses, the Cuban Revolution brought sanitation, schools, health clinics, jobs, housing, and human services to a level not found throughout most of the Third World, and in many parts of the First World. 
infant mortality in Cuba has dropped from 60 per 1,000 in 1960 to 9.7 per 1,000 by 1991, while life expectancy rose from 55 to 75 in that same period. Smallpox, malaria, tuberculosis, typhoid, polio, and numerous other diseases have been wiped out by improved living standards and public health programs. There's a footnote there citing Theodore MacDonald, Hippocrates in Havana, Cuba's healthcare system, 1995. Back to the text, Cuba has enjoyed a level of literacy higher than in the United States and a life expectancy that compares well with advanced industrial nations, according to the NACLA report on the Americas, September-October 1995. Other peoples besides the Cubans have benefited. As Fidel Castro tells it, quote, the Cuban revolution has sent teachers, doctors, and workers to dozens of third world countries without charging a penny. It shed its own blood fighting colonialism, fighting apartheid, and fascism. At one point, we had 25,000 third world students studying on scholarships. We still have many scholarship students from Africa and other countries. In addition, our country has treated more children, 13,000, who were victims of the Chernobyl tragedy than all other countries put together. They don't talk about that, and that's why they blockade us, the country with the most teachers per capita of all countries in the world, including developed countries, the country with the most doctors per capita of all countries, one for every 214 inhabitants, the country with the most art instructors per capita of all countries in the world, the country with the most sports instructors in the world. That gives you an idea of the effort involved a country where life expectancy is more than 75 years. Why are they blockading Cuba? Because no other country has done more for its people. It's the hatred of the ideas that Cuba represents. Unquote. It's from Monthly Review, June 95. Cuba's sin in the eyes of global capitalists is not its, quote, lack of democracy. Most third world capitalist regimes are far more repressive. Cuba's real sin is that it has tried to develop an alternative to the global capitalist system, an egalitarian socioeconomic order that placed corporate property under public ownership, abolished capitalist investors as a class entity, and put people before profits and national independence before IMF servitude. So a conservative think tank like the Heritage Foundation rated Cuba, along with Laos, Iraq, and North Korea, as countries with the lowest level of, quote, economic freedom. Countries with a high level of economic freedom were those that imposed little or no taxes or regulations on business, and did without wage protections, price controls, environmental safeguards, and benefits for the poor. Economic freedom is the real concern of conservatives and plutocrats, the freedom to utilize vast sums of money to accumulate still vaster sums, regardless of the human and environmental costs. Mass productivity, coupled with elitist distribution, results in more wealth for the few and greater poverty for the many. So after two centuries of incredible technological development and unprecedented economic expansion, the number of people living in poverty in the capitalist world has grown more quickly than any other demographic cohort. The world's slum population has increased at a far greater rate than the total global population. Amazing growth in industrial productivity has been accompanied by increasingly desperate want misery, and repression. In short, there is a causal link between vast concentrations of wealth and widespread poverty. The next time someone preaches the free market gospel of economic freedom and productivity, we need ask for whose benefit and at whose cost. Those who show concern for the elites overthrown in the whirl of revolution should also keep in mind the hundreds of millions more who are obliterated by economic reactionism. If all rebellions were to be successfully repressed today and forever, free market autocracies' violence against humanity would be with us more unrestrained than ever, as is indeed happening. For these reasons, those of us who are genuinely concerned about democracy, social justice, and the survival of our planet should support, rather than oppose, popular revolutions. That's the end of Chapter 2. Now starting Chapter 3, left anti-communism. In the United States, for over a hundred years, the ruling interests tirelessly propagated anti-communism among the populace, until it became more like a religious orthodoxy than a political analysis. During the Cold War, the anti-communist ideological framework could transform any data about existing communist societies into hostile evidence. If the Soviets refused to negotiate a point 
they were intransigent and belligerent. If they appeared willing to make concessions, this was but a skillful ploy to put us off our guard. By opposing arms limitations, they would have demonstrated their aggressive intent. But when, in fact, they supported most armament treaties, it was because they were mendacious and manipulative. If the churches in the USSR were empty, this demonstrated that religion was suppressed. But if the churches were full, this meant the people were rejecting the regime's atheistic ideology. If the workers went on strike, as happened on infrequent occasions, this was evidence of their alienation from the collectivist system. If they didn't go on strike, this was because they were intimidated and lacked freedom. A scarcity of consumer goods demonstrated the failure of the economic system. An improvement in consumer supplies meant only that the leaders were attempting to placate a restive population and so maintain a firmer hold over them. If communists in the United States played an important role struggling for the rights of workers, the poor, African Americans, women, and others, this was only their guileful way of gathering support among disenfranchised groups and gaining power for themselves. How one gained power by fighting for the rights of powerless groups was never explained. What we are dealing with is a non-falsifiable orthodoxy, so assiduously marketed by the ruling interests that it affected people across the entire political spectrum. Genuflection to Orthodoxy Many on the U.S. left have exhibited a Soviet bashing and red-baiting that matches anything on the right in its enmity and crudity. Listen to Noam Chomsky holding forth about left intellectuals who try to, quote, rise to power on the backs of mass popular movements, and then, quote, beat the people into submission. You start off as basically a Leninist who's going to be part of the red bureaucracy. You see later that power doesn't lie that way, and you very quickly become an ideologist of the right. We're seeing it right now in the former Soviet Union. The same guys who were communist thugs two years back are now running banks and are enthusiastic free marketeers and praising Americans. Unquote. Quoting from Z Magazine, October 95. Chomsky's imagery is heavily indebted to the same U.S. corporate political culture he so frequently criticizes on other issues. In his mind, the revolution was betrayed by a coterie of, quote, communist thugs who merely hunger for power rather than wanting the power to end hunger. In fact, the communists did not, quote, very quickly switch to the right, but struggled in the face of a momentous onslaught to keep Soviet socialism alive for more than 70 years. To be sure, in the Soviet Union's waning days, some, like Boris Yeltsin, crossed over to capitalist ranks, but others continued to resist free market incursions at great cost to themselves many meeting their deaths during Yeltsin's violent repression of the Russian parliament in 1993. Some leftists and others fall back on the old stereotype of power-hungry Reds who pursue power for power's sake, without regard for actual social goals. If this were true, one wonders why, in country after country, these Reds side with the poor and powerless, often at great risk and sacrifice to themselves, rather than reaping the rewards that come with serving the well-placed. For decades, many left-leaning writers and speakers in the United States have felt obliged to establish their credibility by indulging in anti-communist and anti-Soviet genuflection, seemingly unable to give a talk or write an article or book review on whatever political subject without injecting some anti-red sideswipe. The intent was, and still is, to distance themselves from the Marxist-Leninist left. Adam Hochschild, a liberal writer and publisher, warned those on the left who might be lackadaisical about condemning existing communist societies that they, quote, weaken their credibility, quoting from The Guardian, 523.84. In other words, to be credible opponents of the Cold War, we first had to join in Cold War condemnations of communist societies. Ronald Radosh urged that the peace movement purge itself of communists so that it would not be accused of being communist, Guardian, 316.83. If I understand Radosh, to save ourselves from anti-communist witch hunts, we should ourselves become the witch hunters. Purging the left of communists became a long-standing practice, having injurious effects on various progressive causes. For instance, in 1949, some 12 unions were ousted from the CIO because they had Reds in their leadership. The purge reduced CIO membership by some 1.7 million and seriously weakened its recruitment drives and political clout. In the late 1940s, to avoid being smeared as Reds, Americans for Democratic Action, 
ADA, a supposedly progressive group, became one of the most vocally anti-communist organizations. The strategy did not work. ADA and others on the left were still attacked for being communist or soft on communism by those on the right. Then and now, many on the left have failed to realize that those who fight for social change on behalf of the less privileged elements of society will be red-baited by conservative elites whether they are communists or not. For ruling interests, it makes little difference whether their wealth and power is challenged by, quote, communist subversives or, quote, loyal American liberals. All are lumped together as more or less equally abhorrent. Two quick comments there from me. The first on the CIO purge and then CIO membership went down by 1.7 million. Uh, this was, of course, during McCarthyism. This is a post-war, Cold War, early hysteria. And um, what this resulted in was basically the collapse of the CIO to where it was picked up and became part of the AFL, well, what's today the AFL-CIO or AFL-CIA, perhaps. Anyway, I make frequent reference to this time period because the unions are one example. But really, radicals were driven out of any kind of civil society leadership as the, quote, popular front against fascism broke down and basically all the communists who had helped to win World War II and thought that they would be part of the ruling coalition in the post-war era were basically kicked to the curb. That is at least the opportunist communists who ever held such fantasies. No actual Marxist would ever believe something like that to be possible. And then on point two, as far as, you know, oh, I'm not a communist, you know, you can see this as recently as Bernie Sanders, for example. You know, oh, I'm not a communist, I'm a socialist, oh no, I'm not that kind of socialist, I'm a nice socialist, I'm a democratic socialist, etc. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to the capitalists. They're going to keep slamming you. They slammed Joe Biden as a communist. It plays with their base. You know, they've cultivated this reaction in their base, and they use it politically. So just fight for what you're fighting for. Anyway, continuing, even when attacking the right, left critics cannot pass up an opportunity to flash their anti-communist credentials. So Mark Green writes in a criticism of President Ronald Reagan that, quote, when presented with a situation that challenges his conservative catechism, like an unyielding Marxist-Leninist, Reagan will not change his mind, but the facts, unquote. It's quoting from Mark Green and Gail McCall. There he goes again, Ronald Reagan's Reign of Error, 1983, page 12. While professing a dedication to fighting dogmatism, quote, both of the right and left, individuals who perform such de rigueur genuflections reinforce the anti-communist dogma. Red-baiting leftists contributed their share to the climate of hostility that has given U.S. leaders such a free hand in waging hot and cold wars against communist countries, and which even today makes a progressive or even liberal agenda difficult to promote. Comment there. This was in 97. Uh, post-Bush Cheney, 2001 and on, forget it. A prototypic red basher who pretended to be on the left was George Orwell. In the middle of World War II, as the Soviet Union was fighting for its life against the Nazi invaders at Stalingrad, Orwell announced that a, quote, willingness to criticize Russia and Stalin is the test of intellectual honesty, is the only thing that, from a literary intellectual's point of view, is really dangerous, unquote from the Monthly Review, May 83. Safely ensconced within a virulently anti-communist society, Orwell, with, ironically, Orwellian doublethink, characterized the condemnation of communism as a lonely, courageous act of defiance. Today, his ideological progeny are still at it, offering themselves as intrepid left critics of the left, waging a valiant struggle against imaginary Marxist-Leninist-Stalinist hordes. Sorely lacking within the U.S. left is any rational evaluation of the Soviet Union, a nation that endured a protracted civil war and a multinational foreign invasion in the very first years of its existence, and that two decades later threw back and destroyed the Nazi beast at enormous cost to itself. In the three decades after the Bolshevik Revolution, the Soviets made industrial advances equal to what capitalism took a century to accomplish while feeding and schooling their children rather than working them 14 hours a day, as capitalist industrialists did and still do in many parts of the world. And the Soviet Union, along with Bulgaria, the German Democratic Republic, and Cuba, provided vital assistance to national liberation movements in countries around the world, 
including Nelson Mandela's African National Congress in South Africa. Left anti-communists remained studiously unimpressed by the dramatic gains won by masses of previously impoverished people under communism. Some were even scornful of such accomplishments. I recall how in Burlington, Vermont, in 1971, the noted anti-communist anarchist, Murray Bookchin, derisively referred to my concern for, quote, the poor little children who got fed under communism, unquote. Those are his words. Slinging Labels Those of us who refused to join in the Soviet bashing were branded by left anti-communists as, quote, Soviet apologists and, quote, Stalinists, even if we disliked Stalin and his autocratic system of rule and believed that there were things seriously wrong with existing Soviet society. There's a footnote there. In the first edition of my book, Inventing Reality, New York, St. Martin's Press, 1986, I wrote, quote, The U.S. media's encompassing negativity in regard to the Soviet Union might induce some of us to react with an unqualifiedly glowing view of that society. The truth is, in the USSR, there exist serious problems of labor productivity, industrialization, urbanization, bureaucracy, corruption, and alcoholism. There are production and distribution bottlenecks, plan failures, consumer scarcities, criminal abuses of power, suppression of dissidents, and expressions of alienation among some persons in the population. Unquote. Back to the text. Our real sin was that, unlike many on the left, we refused to uncritically swallow U.S. media propaganda about communist societies. Instead, we maintained that, aside from the well-publicized deficiencies and injustices, there were positive features about existing communist systems that were worth preserving, that improved the lives of hundreds of millions of people in meaningful and humanizing ways. This claim had a decidedly unsettling effect on left anti-communists, who themselves could not utter a positive word about any communist society, except possibly Cuba, and could not lend a tolerant or even courteous ear to anyone who did. There's a footnote there. Many on the U.S. left, who displayed only hostility and loathing toward the Soviet Union and other European communist states, have a warm feeling for Cuba, which they see as having a true revolutionary tradition and a somewhat more open society. In fact, at least until the present, January 1997, Cuba has had much the same system as the USSR and other communist nations, public ownership of industry, a planned economy, close relations with existing communist nations, and one-party rule, with the party playing a hegemonic role in the government, media, labor unions, women's federations, youth groups, and other institutions. Back to the text. Saturated by anti-communist orthodoxy, most U.S. leftists have practiced a left McCarthyism against people who did have something positive to say about existing communism, excluding them from participation in conferences, advisory boards, political endorsements, and left publications. Like conservatives, left anti-communists tolerated nothing less than a blanket condemnation of the Soviet Union as a Stalinist monstrosity and a Leninist moral aberration. Footnote there, Partly in reaction to the ubiquitous anti-communist propaganda that permeated U.S. media and public life, many U.S. communists, and others close to them, refrained from criticizing the autocratic features of the Soviet Union. Consequently, they were accused of thinking that the USSR was a workers, quote, paradise, by critics who seemingly would settle for nothing less than paradisal standards. After the Khrushchev revelations in 1953, U.S. communists grudgingly allowed that Stalin had made, quote, mistakes and even had committed crimes. Back to the text. That many U.S. leftists have scant familiarity with Lenin's writings and political work does not prevent them from slinging the Leninist label. Noam Chomsky, who is an inexhaustible fount of anti-communist caricatures, offers this comment about Leninism. Quote, Western and also third world intellectuals were attracted to the Bolshevik counter-revolution, his term, because Leninism is, after all, a doctrine that says that the radical intelligentsia have a right to take state power and to run their countries by force. Are there any countries that aren't run by force? Sorry. And that is an idea which is rather appealing to intellectuals, unquote. There's a footnote there. That's Chomsky interviewed by Hussein al kurdi in Perception, March, April, 1996. Back to the text. Here, Chomsky fashions an image of power-hungry intellectuals to go along with his cartoon image of power-hungry Leninists. 
villains seeking not the revolutionary means to fight injustice, but power for power's sake. When it comes to red bashing, some of the best and brightest on the left sound not much better than the worst on the right. Comment, I've also heard Chomsky say in a video something to the effect of like, Leninism has absolutely nothing to do with Marxism. It's basically his position on everything to do with the Bolsheviks. Continuing. At the time of the 1996 terror bombing in Oklahoma City, I heard a radio commentator announce, quote, Lenin said that the purpose of terror is to terrorize, unquote. U.S. media commentators have repeatedly quoted Lenin in that misleading manner. In fact, his statement was disapproving of terrorism. He polemicized against isolated terrorist acts which do nothing but create terror among the populace, invite repression, and isolate the revolutionary movement from the masses. Comment, we call this adventurism. Lenin and the Bolsheviks were not fond of it. However, some of the other factions in the various people's movements were. Continuing, far from being the totalitarian, tight-circled conspirator, Lenin urged the building of broad coalitions and mass organizations, encompassing people who were at different levels of political development. He advocated whatever diverse means were needed to advance the class struggle, including participation in parliamentary elections and existing trade unions. To be sure, the working class, like any mass group, needed organization and leadership to wage a successful revolutionary struggle, which was the role of a vanguard party, but that did not mean the proletarian revolution could be fought and won by putschists or terrorists. Lenin constantly dealt with the problem of avoiding the two extremes of liberal bourgeois opportunism and ultra-left adventurism. Comment, we call opportunism a right deviation. It is right, basically, of the center line that communists are trying to walk, and the adventurism is a left deviation. Continuing. Yet he himself is repeatedly identified as an ultra-left putschist by mainstream journalists and some on the left. Whether Lenin's approach to revolution is desirable or even relevant today is a question that warrants critical examination, but a useful evaluation is not likely to come from people who misrepresent his theory and practice. There's a footnote there. I refer the reader to Lenin's books, The State and Revolution, Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder, What is to be Done, and various articles and statements still available in collected editions. Just want to add, here at Socialism for All, we have all three of those books, as well as many other articles and statements. See also John Ehrenberg's treatment of Marxism-Leninism in his The Dictatorship of the Proletariat, Marxism's Theory of Socialist Democracy, Rutledge, 1992. Back to the main text. Left anti-communists find any association with communist organizations morally unacceptable, because of the, quote, crimes of communism. Yet many of them are themselves associated with the Democratic Party in this country, either as voters or as members, apparently unconcerned about the morally unacceptable political crimes committed by leaders of that organization. Under one or another Democratic organization, 120,000 Japanese Americans were torn from their homes and livelihoods and thrown into detention camps, Atomic bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki with an enormous loss of innocent life. The FBI was given authority to infiltrate political groups. The Smith Act was used to imprison leaders of the Trotskyist Socialist Workers Party and later on leaders of the Communist Party for their political beliefs. Detention camps were established to round up political dissidents in the event of a, quote, national emergency. During the late 1940s and 1950s, 8,000 federal workers were purged from government because of their political associations and views, with thousands more in all walks of life witch-hunted out of their careers. The Neutrality Act was used to impose an embargo on the Spanish Republic that worked in favor of Franco's fascist legions. Homicidal counterinsurgency programs were initiated in various Third World countries, and the Vietnam War was pursued and escalated. And for the better part of a century, the congressional leadership of the Democratic Party protected racial segregation and stymied all anti-lynching and fair employment bills. Yet all these crimes, bringing ruination and death to many, have not moved the liberals, the social democrats, and the, quote, democratic socialist anti-communists to insist repeatedly that we issue blanket condemnations of either the Democratic Party or the political system that produced it, certainly not with the intolerant fervor that has been directed against existing communism. Comment there. 
the fundamental task of the U.S. left is to break completely with the Democratic Party and with all capitalist parties. You do not pull them left. They pull you right. They are to be fought, not to be joined. The Democratic Party could stamp out the Republican Party at any time by signing on to popular reforms that are widely demanded by the U.S. public. However, they refuse to do so, instead preferring to keep the country permanently on the brink of fascism by allowing the Republican Party to exist. They could crush it and sweep it up, put it into the dustbin of history. They refuse to do this, and they, it has been demanded of them time and time again. Continuing. Pure socialism versus siege socialism. The upheavals in Eastern Europe did not constitute a defeat for socialism because socialism never existed in those countries, according to some U.S. leftists. They say that the communist states offered nothing more than bureaucratic, one-party, quote, state capitalism, or some such thing. Whether we call the former communist countries socialist is a matter of definition. Suffice it to say, they constituted something different from what existed in the profit-driven capitalist world, as the capitalists themselves were not slow to recognize. First, in communist countries, there was less economic inequality than under capitalism. The perks enjoyed by party and government elites were modest by corporate CEO standards in the West, as were their personal incomes and lifestyles. Soviet leaders like Yuri Andropov and Leonid Brezhnev lived not in lavishly appointed mansions like the White House, but in relatively large apartments in a housing project near the Kremlin set aside for government leaders. They had limousines at their disposal, like most other heads of state, and access to large dachas where they entertained visiting dignitaries. But they had none of the immense personal wealth that most U.S. leaders possess. Comment, almost like the U.S. is ruled by the capitalist class, bunch of rich people, and the USSR was not. Continuing. The, quote, lavish life enjoyed by East Germany's party leaders, as widely publicized in the U.S. press, included a $725 yearly allowance in hard currency and housing in an exclusive settlement on the outskirts of Berlin that sported a sauna, an indoor pool, and a fitness center shared by all the residents. They also could shop in stores that carried Western goods, such as bananas, jeans, and Japanese electronics. The U.S. press never pointed out that ordinary East Germans also had access to public pools and gyms and could buy jeans and electronics, though usually not of the imported variety. Nor was the, quote, lavish consumption enjoyed by East German leaders contrasted to the truly opulent lifestyle enjoyed by the Western plutocracy. Comment, I had a banana this morning. I guess I am now a plutocrat. Second, in communist countries, productive forces were not organized for capital gain and private enrichment. Public ownership of the means of production supplanted private ownership. Individuals could not hire other people and accumulate great personal wealth from their labor. Comment, I just want to stand back and appreciate that sentence for a minute. Individuals could not hire other people. Imagine that. It's actually banned to hire people. What does hire mean, anyway? It means to rent. When you stand back and really take this in, it's such a foreign concept in the United States, for example. The idea that people are not allowed to buy each other's labor, that you have a social system which is better organized than that, that it's not this market chaos, people trying to step on each other to get ahead and or just survive by whatever means necessary. When we talk about reasons why the socialist movement has yet to fully blossom in the United States, just that thought alone, you can't employ people, it's like, huh? I think it just, a lot of people literally cannot imagine it. This may be something to uh, expand upon in the future. Continuing. Again, compared to Western standards, differences in earnings and savings among the populace were generally modest. The income spread between highest and lowest earners in the Soviet Union was about 5 to 1. In the United States, the spread in yearly income between the top multi-billionaires and the working poor is more like 10,000 to 1. Comment, that's the top multi-billionaires. I think that the average CEO to worker ratio is something like, it used to be 200 to 1, I think it's closer to 300 to 1 now. So again, compared to 5 to 1. 
Continuing. Third, priority was placed on human services. Though life under communism left a lot to be desired, and the services themselves were rarely the best, communist countries did guarantee their citizens some minimal standard of economic survival and security, including guaranteed education, employment, housing, and medical assistance. Fourth, communist countries did not pursue the capital penetration of other countries. Lacking a profit motive as their motor force, and therefore having no need to constantly find new investment opportunities, they did not expropriate the lands, labor, markets, and natural resources of weaker nations. That is, they did not practice economic imperialism. The Soviet Union conducted trade and aid relations on terms that generally were favorable to the Eastern European nations and Mongolia, Cuba, and India. All of the above were organizing principles for every communist system to one degree or another. None of the above apply to free market countries like Honduras, Guatemala, Thailand, South Korea, Chile, Indonesia, Zaire, Germany, or the United States. But a real socialism, it is argued, would be controlled by the workers themselves through direct participation instead of being run by Leninists, Stalinists, Castroites, or other ill-willed, power-hungry, bureaucratic cabals of evil men who betray revolutions. Unfortunately, this pure socialism view is ahistorical and non-falsifiable. It cannot be tested against the actualities of history. It compares an ideal against an imperfect reality, and the reality comes off a poor second. It imagines what socialism would be like in a world far better than this one, where no strong state structure or security force is required where none of the value produced by workers needs to be expropriated to rebuild society and defend it from invasion and internal sabotage. The pure socialists' ideological anticipations remain untainted by existing practice. They do not explain how the manifold functions of a revolutionary society would be organized, how external attack and internal sabotage would be thwarted, how bureaucracy would be avoided, scarce resources allocated, policy differences settled, priorities set, and production and distribution conducted. Instead, they offer vague statements about how the workers themselves will directly own and control the means of production and will arrive at their own solutions through creative struggle. No surprise, then, that the pure socialists support every revolution except the ones that succeed. The pure socialists had a vision of a new society that would create and be created by new people, a society so transformed in its fundaments as to leave little opportunity for wrongful acts, corruption, and criminal abuses of state power. There would be no bureaucracy or self-interested coteries, no ruthless conflicts or hurtful decisions. When the reality proves different and more difficult, some on the left proceed to condemn the real thing and announce that they, quote, feel betrayed by this or that revolution. The pure socialists see socialism as an ideal that was tarnished by communist venality, duplicity, and power cravings. The pure socialists oppose the Soviet model, but offer little evidence to demonstrate that other paths could have been taken, that other models of socialism, not created from one's imagination, but developed through actual historical experience, could have taken hold and worked better. Was an open, pluralistic, democratic socialism actually possible at this historic juncture? The historical evidence would suggest it was not. As the political philosopher Carl Shames argued, quote, How do the left critics know that the fundamental problem was the, quote, nature of the ruling revolutionary parties rather than, say, the global concentration of capital that is destroying all independent economies and putting an end to national sovereignty everywhere? And to the extent that it was, where did this nature come from? Was this nature disembodied, disconnected from the fabric of the society itself? from the social relations impacting on it. Thousands of examples could be found in which the centralization of power was a necessary choice in securing and protecting socialist relations. In my observation of existing communist societies, the positive of socialism and the negative of bureaucracy, authoritarianism, and tyranny interpenetrated in virtually every sphere of life. End of quote. That's quoting Carl Shames in correspondence with Parenti, January 1592. The pure socialists regularly blame the left itself for every defeat it suffers. Their second guessing is endless. So we hear that revolutionary struggles fail because their leaders wait too long, 
or act too soon, are too timid or too impulsive, too stubborn or too easily swayed. We hear that revolutionary leaders are compromising or adventuristic, bureaucratic or opportunistic, rigidly organized or insufficiently organized, undemocratic or failing to provide strong leadership. But always, the leaders fail because they do not put their trust in the, quote, direct actions of the workers, who apparently would withstand and overcome every adversity if only given the kind of leadership available from the left critics' own groupuscule. Unfortunately, the critics seem unable to apply their own leadership genius to producing a successful revolutionary movement in their own country. Tony Febo questioned this blame-the-leadership syndrome of the pure socialists. Quote, it occurs to me that when people as smart, different, dedicated, and heroic as Lenin, Mao, Fidel Castro, Daniel Ortega, Ho Chi Minh, and Robert Mugabe, and the millions of heroic people who followed and fought with them, all end up more or less in the same place, then something bigger is at work than who made what decision at what meeting, or even what size houses they went home to after the meeting. These leaders weren't in a vacuum, they're in a whirlwind, and the suction, the force, the power that was twirling them around has spun and left this globe mangled for more than 900 years. And to blame this or that theory or this or that leader is a simple-minded substitute for the kind of analysis that Marxists should make. It's quoting from The Guardian, November 1391. To be sure, the pure socialists are not entirely without specific agendas for building the revolution. After the Sandinistas overthrew the Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua, an ultra-left group in that country called for direct worker ownership of the factories. The armed workers would take control of production without benefit of managers, state planners, bureaucrats, or a formal military. While undeniably appealing, this worker syndicalism denies the necessities of state power. Under such an arrangement, the Nicaraguan Revolution would not have lasted two months against the U.S.-sponsored counter-revolution that savaged the country. It would have been unable to mobilize enough resources to field an army, take security measures, or build and coordinate economic programs and human services on a national scale. Decentralization versus Survival For a people's revolution to survive, it must seize state power and use it to a. break the stranglehold exercised by the owning class over the society's institutions and resources, and b. withstand the reactionary counterattack that is sure to come. The internal and external dangers a revolution faces necessitate a centralized state power that is not particularly to anyone's liking, not in Soviet Russia in 1917, nor in Sandinista Nicaragua in 1980. Engels offers an apposite account of an uprising in Spain in 1872-73 to in which anarchists seize power in municipalities across the country. Comment, I just recently did this on the channel. It's The Bakuninists at Work by Marx and Engels, 1873. At first, the situation looked promising. The king had abdicated, and the bourgeois government could muster but a few thousand ill-trained troops. Yet this ragtag force prevailed, because it faced a thoroughly parochialized rebellion. Quote, Each town proclaimed itself as a sovereign canton, and set up a revolutionary committee, or junta, Engels writes. Quote, Each town acted on its own, declaring that the important thing was not cooperation with other towns, but separation from them thus precluding any possibility of a combined attack against bourgeois forces. It was, quote, the fragmentation and isolation of the revolutionary forces, which enabled the government troops to smash one revolt after the other, unquote. There's a footnote there. In her biography of Louise Michel, the anarchist historian Edith Thomas asserts that anarchism is the, quote, absence of government, the direct administration by people of their own lives, unquote. Who could not want that? Thomas doesn't say how it would work, except to assert that, quote, anarchists want it right now, in all the confusion and disorder of right now, unquote. She proudly notes that anarchism, quote, is still intact as an ideal, for it has never been tried, unquote. That is exactly the problem. Why, in so many hundreds of actual rebellions, including ones led by anarchists themselves, has anarchism never been tried? or never succeeded in surviving for any length of time in a, quote, intact anarchist form. In the anarchist uprising Engels described, the rebels, in seeming violation of their own ideology, did not rely on Thomas's direct administration by the people, but set up ruling juntas, 
the unpracticed, unattainable quality of the ideal helps it to retain its better-than-anything appeal in the minds of some. Back to the main text. Decentralized parochial autonomy is the graveyard of insurgency, which may be one reason why there has never been a successful anarcho-syndicalist revolution. Ideally, it would be a fine thing to have only local, self-directed worker participation, with minimal bureaucracy, police, and military. This probably would be the development of socialism, were socialism ever allowed to develop unhindered by counter-revolutionary subversion and attack. One might recall how, in 1918-20, to 20, 14 capitalist nations, including the United States, invaded Soviet Russia in a bloody but unsuccessful attempt to overthrow the revolutionary Bolshevik government. The years of foreign invasion and civil war did much to intensify the Bolsheviks' siege psychology with its commitment to lockstep party unity and a repressive security apparatus. Thus, in May 1921, the same Lenin who had encouraged the practice of internal party democracy and struggled against Trotsky in order to give the trade unions a greater measure of autonomy, now called for an end to the workers' occupation and other factional groups within the party. There's a footnote there. Trotsky was among the more authoritarian Bolshevik leaders, least inclined to tolerate organizational autonomy, diverse views, and internal party democracy. But in the fall of 1923, finding himself in a minority position, outmaneuvered by Stalin and others, Trotsky developed a sudden commitment to open party procedures and workers' democracy. Ever since, he has been hailed by some followers as an anti-Stalinist Democrat. Back to the text. The time has come, he told an enthusiastically concurring Tenth Party Congress, to put an end to opposition, to put a lid on it, we have had enough opposition." Unquote. Open disputes and conflicting tendencies within and without the party, the communists concluded, created an appearance of division and weakness that invited attack by formidable foes. Only a month earlier, in April 1921, Lenin had called for more worker representation on the party's central committee. In short, he had become not anti-worker, but anti-opposition. Here was a social revolution, like every other, that was not allowed to develop its political and material life in an unhindered way. Footnote there, regarding the several years before 1921, the Sovietologist Stephen Cohen writes, quote, The experience of civil war and war communism profoundly altered both the party and the emerging political system." Unquote. Other socialist parties were expelled from the Soviets, and the Communist Party's quote, democratic norms, as well as its almost libertarian and reformist profile, gave way to a quote, rigid authoritarianism and pervasive militarization. Unquote. Much of the popular control exercised by local Soviets and factory committees was eliminated. In the words of one Bolshevik leader, quote, the Republic is an armed camp. See Cohen's Bukharin and the Bolshevik Revolution, Oxford University Press, 1973. Back to the text. By the late 1920s, the Soviets faced the choice of A, moving in a still more centralized direction, with a command economy and forced agrarian collectivization and full-speed industrialization under a commandist, autocratic party leadership, the road taken by Stalin, or B, moving in a liberalized direction, allowing more political diversity, more autonomy for labor unions and other organizations, more open debate and criticism, greater autonomy among the various Soviet republics, a sector of privately owned small businesses, independent agricultural development by the peasantry, greater emphasis on consumer goods, and less effort given to the kind of capital accumulation needed to build a strong military-industrial base. The latter course, I believe, would have produced a more comfortable, more humane, and serviceable society. Siege socialism would have given way to worker-consumer socialism. The only problem is that the country would have risked being incapable of withstanding the Nazi onslaught. Instead, the Soviet Union embarked upon a rigorous, forced industrialization. This policy has often been mentioned as one of the wrongs perpetrated by Stalin upon his people. Footnote there, to give one of innumerable examples, Recently, Roger Burbach faulted Stalin for, quote, rushing the Soviet Union headlong on the road to industrialization. See his correspondence in Monthly Review, March 96, page 35. Back to the text. It consisted mostly of building, within a decade, an entirely new, 
huge industrial base east of the Ural Mountains in the middle of the Barren Steppes, the biggest steel complex in Europe in anticipation of an invasion from the West. Quote, money was spent like water. Men froze, hungered, and suffered, but the construction went on with a disregard for individuals and a mass heroism seldom paralleled in history. Unquote. Footnote there, it's from John Scott, Behind the Urals, an American worker in Russia's City of Steel, 1942. Back to the text. Stalin's prophecy that the Soviet Union had only 10 years to do what the British had done in a century proved correct. When the Nazis invaded in 1941, that same industrial base, safely ensconced thousands of miles from the front, produced the weapons of war that eventually turned the tide. The cost of this survival included 22 million Soviet citizens who perished in the war, and immeasurable devastation and suffering, the effects of which would distort Soviet society for decades afterward. All this is not to say that everything Stalin did was of historical necessity. The exigencies of revolutionary survival did not, quote, make inevitable the heartless execution of hundreds of old Bolshevik leaders, the personality cult of a supreme leader who claimed every revolutionary gain as his own achievement, the suppression of party political life through terror, the eventual silencing of debate regarding the pace of industrialization and collectivization, the ideological regulation of all intellectual and cultural life, and the mass deportations of, quote, suspect nationalities. The transforming effects of counter-revolutionary attack have been felt in other countries. A Sandinista military officer I met in Vienna in 1986 noted that Nicaraguans were, quote, not a warrior people, but they had to learn to fight because they faced a destructive U.S.-sponsored mercenary war. She bemoaned the fact that war and embargo forced her country to postpone much of its socioeconomic agenda. As with Nicaragua, so with Mozambique, Angola, and numerous other countries in which U.S.-financed mercenary forces destroyed farmlands, villages, health centers, and power stations, while killing or starving hundreds of thousands. The revolutionary baby was strangled in its crib or mercilessly bled beyond recognition. This reality ought to earn at least as much recognition as the suppression of dissidents in this or that revolutionary society. The overthrow of Eastern European and Soviet communist governments was cheered by many left intellectuals. Now democracy would have its day. The people would be free from the yoke of communism, and the U.S. left would be free from the albatross of existing communism. Or, as left theorist Richard Lichtman put it, quote, liberated from the incubus of the Soviet Union and the succubus of communist China, unquote. That is terrible, terrible writing. In fact, the capitalist restoration in Eastern Europe seriously weakened the numerous Third World liberation struggles that had received aid from the Soviet Union and brought a whole new crop of right-wing governments into existence, ones that now worked hand-in-glove with U.S. global counter-revolutionaries around the globe. In addition, the overthrow of communism gave the green light to the unbridled exploitative impulses of Western corporate interests, no longer needing to convince workers that they live better than their counterparts in Russia and no longer restrained by a competing system. The corporate class is rolling back the many gains that working people in the West have won over the years. Now that the free market, in its meanest form, is emerging triumphant in the East, so will it prevail in the West. Comment there. This was, again, written in the late 90s. This was prior to the War on Terror, prior to 2008, prior to the 2010s austerity, all the things that have happened since then. So, at this time in the late 90s, they were already taking the mask off, and it's just gotten worse and worse since that time. There's no real end in sight for any of this, at least from within the system. I mean, there's no built-in limit in capitalism to this. It's only going to come from working class resistance, rebellion, revolution. That's why I do this channel. Continuing. Capitalism with a human face, so-called, is being replaced by capitalism in your face. That is, that makes me smile. That is so lame, but it's so lovable. Anyway, as Richard Levins put it, Quote, so in the new exuberant aggressiveness of world capitalism, we see what communists and their allies had held at bay. Unquote. Monthly Review 996. That's an excellent quote. In the new exuberant aggressiveness of world capitalism, we see what communists and their allies had held at bay. So 
really, you know, all this was taken for granted. Then, you know, and everybody's bitching about the Soviet Union and this and that. And obviously it had flaws. It exists in the real world, etc. But once it was gone, it's, you know, there's that Stalin quote about like what would happen if the Soviet Union fell, the era of darkest reaction would usher in. Yeah, that's literally what we're living in now. It's awful. It's far worse than I think anybody was prepared to deal with. And, you know, I really wonder if you went back and showed all these, you know, left critics of the Soviet Union and China and all this, um, what was in store in the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and 2020s. If you could go back and show them what actually was being prevented, I mean, I wonder if more of them wouldn't have changed their tune and found ways to be constructively critical rather than just trying to wash their hands of trying to do any Marxism in the real world. I think that a tremendous amount was taken for granted and now it's gone and we're getting sucked down to the 10th level of hell. So anyway, continuing, having never understood the role that existing communist powers played in tempering the worst impulses of Western capitalism and imperialism, and having perceived communism as nothing but an unmitigated evil, the left anti-communists did not anticipate the losses that were to come. Some of them still don't get it. And that's the end of chapter three. So, a lot of food for thought there. I've given all of my comments already. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comments section, as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They are also materially helpful, so I really appreciate them a lot. I've been able to do more content on this channel than I would have been able to do without their support. So if you like this channel, thank me, but also thank a patron and consider becoming one yourself. I know I may seem like a machine cranking out all this content as I do. However, I'm very much a real live person and I both have bills to pay and morale to try to keep up. So it really does help. Otherwise, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting on the videos, all of that helps to build the channel, boost it in the YouTube algorithm, helps more people who might be looking for answers to sociological questions to find them, to come across this channel. So thank you to everybody for your engagement with the channel, hopefully constructive engagement, as it has made it easier to find this content for everybody out there who needs to see it. So I appreciate that, as do others. Finally, as the slogan goes, agitate, educate, and organize. Organizing is not going to happen on a YouTube channel, so look around in your community for organizations you can join that are active, healthy, people get along, it's not dysfunctional, people aren't burned out or worse, that responds in a timely manner when contacted, that has real ties to the community, doing really useful work that you'd like to be a part of, all that kind of thing is some of what you want to look for in an org. Being in a good org can be great. Being in a bad org can be life-shattering. So choose carefully. Otherwise, thanks again for listening, and we will catch you in the next video.